Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jess Sugars from Olympus UK and today in connection with the bird fair we are doing a workshop about birds in flight and getting the best out of your Olympus camera with wildlife photography. So not all of you guys here are Olympus users so today is going to be walking that line between you guys that absolutely know everything about the kit and some people that don't know anything. Um, so we've muted all the microphones but any questions please just chip in as and when. But today we're predominantly going to be looking at the EM1, uh, the X, and obviously all our lovely lightweight long lenses. So things like the 40 to 150, the 300mm, and the rather exciting 1 to 400, which is brand new on the block. And I'm going to cover this one in a bit more detail within a PowerPoint not too long from now. Okay, so just a couple of things before I start. Uh, today is going to be structured into three sections. So I'm going to do a small bit of PowerPoint covering the product, the lenses, and then secondly, I'm going to plug in a camera and walk through how to do these settings, what's best to put on your OMD and how to set that up onto a custom dial. And then we'll have a little bit of an open forum at the end for you guys to ask any questions that you fancy. Obviously, if you're feeling a bit shy, uh, you can book a one-to-one -one with myself or any of my colleagues at any point via the Olympus website, so you're more than welcome to do that. But before I go anywhere, I would just like to, oh, one second, I just need to admit one more person. Excellent. Uh, hello, Sharon, you haven't missed anything yet? Okay, so I just need to run through a couple of bits. Uh, obviously, the Bird Fair is linked up with Park Cameras and Wex Photographic, and they're doing some incredible deals off the back of this event, this virtual event going on. So a couple that caught my eye that I thought I'd probably share with you if you were looking to upgrade maybe from a, a lower o OMD or jump ship completely. Uh, the EM1X currently has got £400 off it. Uh, an EM1 Mark II, you're looking at £150 off the top. And that lovely 300mm Prime that we do has got £400 off at the moment. So there's some really nice deals out there. And obviously, speak to your retailer. I'm sure that if you're doing a big switch, they would love to get you on board and give you a good deal. Okay, so let's not hold up and let's start with the PowerPoint. So one second while I share my screen. Okay, here we go. Oop. There we go, lovely. And I'm just going to get rid of that picture of me for the moment. There we go. Okay, so here's some lovely examples of photographs taken by some of our ambassadors using the rather impressive zoom lenses on the Olympus kit. As I said, my name is Jay Sugars. I'm a product specialist for Olympus. A uh, bit of backstory, I've been shooting since the good old days where you, could see the, uh, you couldn't see the picture on the back and you had to develop it in a tank and hand print it. Um, I've done everything from sort of a bit of press, uh, but predominantly I'm a street photographer. Uh, but as Olympus's products have got closer and closer towards being this exceptional product for wildlife photography, I too have embraced my bird feeder and obviously gone into hides and spent many hours uh, learning how to shoot best practice for this type of photography. So my next bit is going to run through some of the wonderful features on the Olympus cameras. The next bit is a short video on the EM1X. Uh, and then after that, I'm going to unpack some of this wonderful technology. So one minute, let's go. Thank <laughs> you. 
Wowzers, there you go. Pretty impressive video. So let me unpack some of those features for you. So today, like I said, we're looking at the X and the Mark III and the Mark II, all very similar cameras within the same range. Oh, hello, Sarah. Let me just admit you one second. Uh, just to let you know, Sarah, all of this is being recorded, so you'll be able to get uh, some of the bits that you've missed, but you haven't missed much yet. Okay, so the EM1 Mark III. Oh, one sec. Try and bring that back. There we go. So the EM1 Mark III, what's so great about our products is the size and the weight. You could have an EM1 Mark III and a 300 mil lens and it's gonna weigh less than 2,000 grams. It's 100, and uh, sorry, 1,900 grams, which is an incredibly light product. All of our lenses have an incredibly uh, light build to them, but still have that robustness that you'd expect. Hello, I'm just letting someone else in again as well. Brilliant. So let me give you some idea of some of the measurements on these products. So things like the 300 mil, you're looking at uh, sort of 1,270 grams, which is incredibly light. Or things like the new one to 400, again, only 1,120 grams. Much smaller, much lighter than your old, uh, other alternatives in the market. Just waiting for the slide to catch up. There we go, wonderful. One of the best technologies Olympus has is the in-camera stabilization. So on our top end cameras, you can get between seven and seven and a half stop stabilization. So that means on a very good day, I can hand hold my camera to what, two or three seconds and it will be absolutely pin tack sharp. And the joy of mirrorless cameras is obviously the focusing system from edge to edge is as good as it is at the edge as it is in the middle. So often dealing with wildlife, they're a little bit unpredictable and a bit skittish, and you can't guarantee that they're gonna be barreling right down the middle of your lens. So it's really nice with the Olympus cameras to know that your crosshairs go from the very edge all the way to the middle and over again. Whereas with a traditional DSLR setup, they'd only be sat in the middle of the sensor and obviously you're not gonna get that advantage the whole way across. So really great feature for any wildlife. And you can also get up to 60 frames a second full resolution out of the EM1 Mark II, Mark III and the X. So again, ideal for the type of photography we're looking at currently. Or 18 frames with continuous tracking, which again is a market leading feature. We've even got something called Pro Capture built into our cameras, which again, I'm going to run through on the setup if you haven't come across this yet uh, in a moment. But what happens here is it is a pre-burst mode, essentially. So imagine you're waiting for a whale uh, on a boat somewhere in the Atlantic and you're waiting for it to breach and it breaches, comes out the water and slams back down. You forgot to press the shutter as you saw it come out because you were so blown away by the experience, but you've pressed the shutter as it's just come out the water. In this mode, it will rewind history 35 frames. So in theory, you would get the whole spectrum of the whale coming out of the water. And again, it works really nicely for sort of bird feeder shots like these examples here, especially with things like blue tits and robins, which are so very quick. It gives you the opportunity to go, oh, that was good. And obviously in Pro Capture, you're going to be able to rewind a little bit further than where you are currently. Uh, again, we have a plethora of high quality Pro Glass. And as I said, we're going to talk about that in a moment. You've also got 
in the EM1 Mark III and in the X, a handheld high res mode of 50 megapixels. So this isn't ideal for birds in flight, but it's great for landscape. It's great for uh, non-moving subject matters. Um, I've even done a bit of street photography with this, and it means that I can crop the, the image to bits, but I can also put it on the side of a house if I wanted to, because the resolution is obviously so much higher. We also have something called in-camera focus stacking, which is probably one of my favorite features, especially while we've been in lockdown for COVID-19. Uh, the ability to be able to do stacking uh, with the flowers in the garden, with the, with the insects that are coming in is truly fantastic. And on the EM1 Mark III and the X, you can do up to 15 frames of stacking. I normally start at somewhere between eight or nine, but once you get really efficient with this, you can do the full 15, which is again, a great feature. And if you wanna run through that with me, again, book a one-to-one -one and I'll gladly walk you through step by step. We also have a dedicated night mode on the last two cameras, which means things like your lifetime and life composite are all in one place and you don't have to dig around in the manual settings. And what's great about lifetime is it means that you can do some ND or some astral photography. But also with these cameras, you have a built-in live ND filter handheld up to five stops. So again, really useful for river photography. Uh, but if you want to take that a step further, again, you'll probably want filters and the uh, lifetime feature. And again, that's something that I do a lot of. And if you'd like to chat about that, please um, hook me up for a conversation on that. No problems at all. And what's really nice about our cameras is the ergonomics, the way they're laid out. They're really good for back button focus. Um, and again, back button focus is where you divide the functions uh, from the front to the back and the front. And it gives you more control, particularly when doing macro and wildlife photography, which is the two sort of specialists you guys that are obviously on this would be most interested in. So I'm gonna walk you through that as well in a moment really well weather sealed kit you know you can uh, you can get properly drenched as long as you've got a pro lens on there and your camera will be absolutely fine I often sit my cameras in puddles to get good reflection shots they're incredibly durable and very well weather sealed products and as you can see really strong metal chassis underneath USB charge, which is really useless, uh, really, sorry, really useful with mirrorless cameras, particularly because uh, they're so power hungry, you can charge on the go. So when you're having your lunch in the hide, it means you can plug your camera in and start recharging your batteries on the go, which is a really nice feature. We've got the world's best dust reduction system because we invented it on the first e-system cameras. And I've cleaned a handful of sensors in the last nine, 10 years. So again, really effective dust reduction system. You've got a very durable shutter built into these cameras as well. You can do 400,000 shots before you even consider having to have it looked at. So again, real pro end spec. But if you're shooting in silent shutter mode, like most of us are doing for wildlife photography or street photography, you're not even aging that mechanism at all. You've got a dual card slot, so you can double up or split what you want onto different cards. And again, you've got that important multi-selector. Uh, I really like the multi-selector on this predominantly because when you click it in, it will center it as well, which is super useful when you're trying to track things. Looking at the roadmap, we've got some interesting stuff on the roadmap here. We've got a macro lens on the way. Uh, we've got an eight to 25 on the way. And as you can see, we've also got our 150-400, which is obviously uh, a 4.5 and is no secret. And again, I'm gonna cover that in a mo. Okay, so let's talk about the brand new lens that's in my hands right now, which is the 1 to 400. So it's an f5 to 6.3. So that means at the far end at the 100, it starts at 5. And then by the time I get to the far end, it will be a 6.3. The hole will close down slightly. It's a very well built lens. It feels like one of our pro lenses, even though it doesn't sit with our pro lenses. Uh, it's weather sealed uh, like our pro lenses. The two caveats that it hasn't got that would make it a pro lens that our lenses normally have would be, it doesn't have a pullback manual ring. Um, it doesn't have the dual stabilization. And it also, um, to be a pro, it would have to end at F5 or 4.5 or somewhere around there. So to keep the size of the product down to a reasonable mid-range size and obviously cost of well under a few thousand pounds, uh, it ends at 6.3. But it punches well above its weight for image quality. Pretty much every reviewer has said that. I've had one for a couple of weeks and I'm blown away by what it does at the far end for the price point. The price point on this one currently, you're looking at 1,100 pounds. It's got nine blades in there. And like I said, it's very, very light at you know 1,100 grams. And size-wise, again, you're looking at sort of 
205 millimeters by 86. So really not a massive product, but it gives me 800 millimeters in full terms. You can also put a 1.4 and, an, uh, and a two on a two times converter onto this product as well, which again is an incredible reach for the price point. And here's a couple of sample images uh, by one of, our, uh, one of our photographers in Europe. What's really nice about our stuff as well is the close focusing abilities of all of our lenses. Because we've got a smaller chip in our cameras, the close focusing is brilliant. So as the bird gets super close to you, you don't lose that continuous tracking that you're doing on it. But also while you're waiting for birds, you can delve around, looking around the height and take great photos of dragonflies, snails. And again, you can use your teleconverters for all of these as well. Uh, the 40 to 150, the 1 to 400 and the 300 are great, have all got between 1.3 and 1.5 distance for close focusing. So you can do some really nice macro with them. Like I said, they're weather sealed. So again, really well protected. You should have no problems being out in a lovely uh, British winter. And here's what the side of the lenses look like. So having ditched, well not ditched, but certainly not used the, uh, the pullback ring, you have a, a manual and AF switch, which is a traditional kind of long lens feature. You have image stabilization built into the lens and the body on our products. And you have to choose between which one you want to use to be more effective. From my experience currently with this lens, I find the in-lens stabilization particularly effective at the long end. And when I'm at the shorter end, I generally like to use the body. So the lens stabilization is probably the most effective, I would say, uh, while doing birds with this particular lens. You also have a lock built in so the lens doesn't wander while you're walking along. Uh, but I haven't found it wanders anyway, even with it kind of held down in that position. You've got an Arco Swiss plate to slot into, but again, I just whip that off and I walk around handheld. That's the idea of the Olympus system for me. You've also got the ability to do a bit of stacking with this lens, which is fantastic. All our pro lenses do stacking, which means when, you're, when you find a nice uh, dragonfly or butterfly sat somewhere, it means you can stack it and get the whole creature in and the leaf. And so a little bit of an update here on the current long end pro lens. So that's a 150 to 400, 4.5 the whole way through with a built in teleconverter. So white um, build predominantly to keep the heat uh, resistance working properly within it. And again, I've seen a mock up of this and it's not a million miles bigger than the current 300 mil. Uh, that's what the converter looks like on the inside. And again, this lens is going to give you obviously 800 millimeters um, at 4.5. It will take both the converters as well, which is fantastic. It will be weather sealed as you'd expect. And again, you've got some nice functionality on the lens as well. You can put the IS off and on. Uh, you can uh, set up function buttons. Again, that's the sort of thing that you're probably used to on pro end super long lenses. So again, some really nice uh, sort of design gone into this lens. And like everything Olympus wise, this will be a cracking lens optically. Okay, great. So I'm just going to switch uh, between uh, the PowerPoint and uh, my camera. So give me one moment. I just need to switch HDMI cables. So I'm just plugging in now. Has anyone got any questions while I'm doing this bit? Okay, give me one second. I'm just gonna stop sharing the screen and bring my camera up. Brilliant. I always like it when I can see my camera appear on the screen, fantastic. Okay, so let's start with some of the basics. Uh, so I am on an EM1 Mark III as discussed earlier. Um, I've pressed OK to bring up my super control panel. And this is the main access menu for most things on our Olympus cameras from day to day. Normally I will start at 800 ISO. Uh, that means on a sunny day, um, it means it's incredibly quick. Uh, but if it's a slightly grim day or a cloud appears, it means I've got the opportunity to get a decent shutter speed in. And I can always dial it back down using my front dial in the viewfinder. Oh, I've just got a question. One second, and let me just grab that. Certainly. Okay, yes. Um, right, so there's a couple of questions I've been asked. So firstly about the 1 to 400. So the stabilization on this one 
isn't dual IS. So with our 300 mil and our 12 to 100, when you put it onto your EM1s or your five, uh, you will get dual stabilization. So it will work the body and the lens in sync with each other. With this new mid-range lens, um, it will not work together. They work separately. You can run them at the same time, uh, but you will find that it probably, well, I found it does slow things down a little bit. So you have to make a choice between using the lens or the body stabilization. And generally, when you're using a, a, this sort of lens, you'll be using the very far end, I suspect, trying to get those little blue tits in the garden. So you'd want to use the lens stabilization. Again, it's playing around with best practice for that. And another question, uh, bird detection. Uh, is that will that be available on the EM1 Mark III? Uh, there is a talk of this um, software coming to us. You're just going to have to bear with us on this space. Uh, we will get back to you on that. I can't confirm anything currently on any sort of animal detection, but just watch this space. Okay, brilliant. So let's continue. Brilliant. So I'll press OK and bring up my super control panel and I would normally have it on 800. You can also do your white balance custom if you want to as well. So you've got all of these sunny, shadow, cloudy, etc. But if you choose the very bottom setting, you can actually custom it. And that's a really nice option because it means you can make it warmer or cooler as you look through it. And again, I'm adjusting that on the dial there. So normally I'd shoot at somewhere around 5,800, which is the slightly warmer end of natural. Okay. The next adjustment I would make is I would put it into continuous AF. So you've got the opportunity to have single AF, continuous AF with tracking. I'm a bit old school. I'd go continuous AF with manual override. I'll switch the face detection off because obviously no humans involved in this. And I'd then go down to the metering options here. So again, predominantly I would use evaluated metering, uh, but for wildlife, macro, and things like this, I generally go for either a spot or a center weighted. I generally go center weighted because I really struggle to get the spot on what I'm shooting. So center weighted works nicely because all those birds are generally, they're a light, they're a gray, they're some sort of color, and generally is some sort of gloomy background. So you really want to meet a for your bird. They are absolutely your subject matter. Okay, and then go over left to here. This is your drive menu. So. Traditionally, you've got your H modes, so single, silent, you've got your sequential high, sequential uh, H uh, high with the silent, this will be your 60 frames a second with a single focal spot. Then you've got your pro capture, which will be 35 frames before you burst. Then you've got your L settings, and I actually prefer using L settings because on all the L settings, you are getting autofocus in between. So on silent L, I'm gonna get 18 frames a second, which is more than enough, I think, for most people. It's gonna give me a really good accuracy, and I'm gonna get loads and loads of shots. Okay, so that's pretty much how I set up the back there. Something else I wanna share with you best practice as well is if you go to the cog in the corner here, you can also set all your function buttons from here. I know you can do it from the main menu, but I find this quite a nice way of doing it. And also don't forget, you've also got a function button on your lens. Quite a lot of people like to pop a magnifier on there or uh, manual focus. There's plenty of options that you can drop onto those to override things. And again, you can set up your grip if you use one as well. So the ones that I normally adjust are down here, these two here, in the modern digital age, you don't overly need depth of field view, depth of field preview, and one touch white balance. Uh, so what I've done is I've dropped the white touch white balance and I've popped on a magnifier. But as you can see, there's tons and tons of stuff you can stick on here, which is fantastic. You could even go for some more custom settings if you wanted to as well. Uh, but there's plenty of buttons and dials, uh, 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 slots on the dial and buttons, I think, to choose everything that you need. You've got your ISO button here. I generally change this to the area selector. I find it a nice spot. And generally I do my ISO via the super control panel. That's the joy of these cameras. You can set them up as you like. You've also got your back button focus here, which I'm gonna set up in a moment. But you could obviously put that back button feature, which is this setting here, AEL slash AFL, pretty much any button you like. But I'll leave it in its traditional place. You've got your video button here. A lot of people don't do video. So again, you could go across and change that to something else. Um, I put peaking here. Um, I generally put peaking on a button and don't have it as an auto for when I press manual because I find it a little bit distracting. I press peaking whenever I feel I'm unsure about my focus and combining that with my 
magnifier there. I feel very comfortable that I can make sure things are sharp, particularly when doing back button on a bird's nest or something like that. Okay, so that's my button set up on the back. And now I'm gonna press menu and bring up my menu. So most of the functions we're after are in the cog. Um, just so you know, camera two is full of things like bracketing and multiple exposure and your high rest adjustments and your live ND shooting. So all sort of creative stuff. But most of your functionality to generally adjust your camera in the cog. A is all related to pretty much what we're looking at today, which is the way that the focusing and the uh, focusing system works really and the shots work. B is for buttons and C is for continuous. We'll touch on that a little bit. D is for display. So things like switching off your, your beep is available in that display. Again, you've got grid settings, which does highly recommend that you use a grid. Just helps you centralize things as you go. So there's plenty to play around with in here, but what we're mainly looking at today is setting up for some good wildlife shots. So you go across into A1. Uh, on the older models, you don't have to do this, but on the Mark III and the X, you will. Um, the manual override, which means I don't have to pull the switch back, is here. So you just turn that from off to on. And that means whenever I touch the, uh, the ring of the lens, it's going to go into manual focus. It's just old school and a really easy way of working. Right, back button focusing is located here. So back button means that the focusing will be done where my thumb is, where that button, that's called AEL slash AFL, which is your, a meter locking uh, feature back in the good old days. Uh, but I'm gonna use that for all the focusing. So what I do is I go across here, and generally, even though I'm only using continuous AF for birding, I'll generally also do single AF at the same time, just so if I do anything different, I'm still in back button. So you just go across and you go from mode one, to mode three. And as you can see by the layout below, it means that the single AF is done by the button that's by it. And when I press full exposure, uh, the full button down, I will expose my image. Continuous AF, again, you wanna go from mode one down to mode three or four. The only difference between these two is between half press and full press, it's doing an exposure lock. I generally just do it all in the one go. And then an important one that you have to adjust in you know, our more modern cameras is the halfway AF. So you can leave back button on and have it on the front, which um, can be useful, but I find it a little confusing and as do other people. So what you want to do is just maybe go from operative to inoperative. So we're in proper old school back button focus. So that's done. Brilliant. Next option that uh, you generally tinker with, depending on what type of photography, is the continuous AF sensitivity. If you're doing birds, cats, wildlife, anything that's a bit twitchy, you want it on high, in my opinion. If you're doing cars and drifting and all that sort of stuff, you want it on low. And the reason you put it on low for that is you don't want it grabbing the cone or the thing slightly in the frame uh, that you're not after. So you're making it slightly smoother in its kind of sensitivity. But for what we're doing, especially with birds in flight, like swallows and, and kingfishers, it's tough enough as it is. So we definitely want it as bitey as possible. Popped it on there. Your next one that you wanna make sure that you got selected is your continuous AF center start. So again, just make sure that they're all switched on. I've also got them all switched on, not only for the presets in the camera, which is up to five by five, but all my custom ones as well. Because if I wanna create custom ones, they need to be switched on. Continuous AF sense priority. Again, you wanna click all of those, get them on, because it means it will try and focus from the center of your area grid, which is probably most important. Mode settings. So again, you can go across here and switch all of your modes on, which means they'll show up in your menu system when you scroll through them. This one here is quite an important one. I hear a lot about customers going, what is this one for? So this is area pointer. Out the box, it's set on one. I put it on two because it means, as you can see in the display here, when I go to the full grid selection, so I've tried to shoot my birds, single spot, then gone up to a nine, still haven't grabbed it. So emergency time, birds flying away. I've grabbed the whole selection area. And when you're in continuous AF with this and it's set on two, it will do 3D tracking, which it will try and grab what it thinks is moving. It's great for groups of moving animals. It's really good against busy backgrounds as well. So that is your last ditch attempt to get the shot before you lose your creature. So you probably wanna pop that one on as well. Other settings worth adjusting, you can also do your loop setting, which means when I run off the screen with my focus square, it appears on the other side. 
You've got your custom mode settings. So again, I can set up custom modes. And again, they're super easy. So let's just set one up now. Go into can see two, go to size. So I'm gonna make a centerized one. So something like, yeah, let's go with that. Press okay. And then I can even choose how it steps. So we could adjust it like this. So let's go for something like that and press okay. That means I've created now a custom setting. Yeah, okay, uh, absolutely. I've just had a question asking uh, possibly to cover what 3D tracking means. So 3D tracking is basically the long and the short is. It's looking for animal faces. It's looking for animal shapes. So uh, kind of, yeah, bodies as such. And it is gonna try and grab a grouping onto that as it's moving out the subject. So I normally think of groups of horses running for some reason when I think of this. Or let's say a uh, oh, perfect example would be a, a murmuration of starlings at Brighton Pier. What you could do is you put it into this and this will 3D track around your screen. Um, yeah, that's the best way I, I, I've got to describe that. Okay, uh, if you want any more, try it out, get it set up, have a go. And obviously, if you want to run through that one-to-one, -one, then book me for a one-to-one. -one. That'd be lovely. Okay, other settings. No problem. My pleasure. Um, other settings, things like AF limiters. This is more for your, your motorbike photographers and your kind of car photographers because you'll be stood in a pit somewhere. And it means that you can set, let's say you keep grabbing the fence by accident. It means you can go, well, that fence is... 10, 15 meters away, you could set it up and then you could put that setting on there. You could also drop that onto a custom setting. That's quite a nice one to have set up as well. Always remember to switch it off when you're not using it because you go to use your camera again and go, why isn't it focusing? So it's one to try and remember. Okay, and that is pretty much it. Oh, another one I want to go to just quickly. If you don't want to use a button for your peaking and you want it to jump in straight away manually, then manual assist is your area to look at with here. So again, you'd go into peaking and you just have it on. And when it's on it, in manual assist, it will jump straight on for you whenever you touch it. Okay, brilliant. Well, you can just have it off, great. And another one, uh, all of our clutches on our longer lenses, some people pull them back by accident and they go to pull out their camera and they go to take a shot and they go, why isn't it taking a picture? If you want to, you can make that inoperative as well. Uh, but I think once you've done it once, uh, you generally remember to go check it. Brilliant. Okay, so that's pretty much it. So we've got everything set. Let's have a look at the back of the camera. Yeah, so this looks like a pretty good wildlife setting. So all I need to do now is go menu and you want to come back out your A menu and go to the cog and then go up, 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 up to camera one, camera menu one, go to reset. You're not going to reset your camera, not today anyway. And you're going to go down to where it says assign to custom mode. And here is where all those lovely settings are for your dial. And again, a bit of best, best practice here. You don't need to be in C1 on the dial to set up a C1. You could be in any setting you like. You go, oh, this is working really nicely. I like this. And then all you have to do is tweak, 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 menu, jump to here, go set, press OK and set it. You then got that saved. So what I often would do now is I go, OK, well, this is my general bird mode. This is saved on C1, but I want it a bit faster. So all you do now is go into here and choose maybe Pro Capture H, go OK, and that is now ready to be set onto C2. So you go Menu, Custom Mode, Assign to Custom Mode, and then drop that onto C2. So then you've got what I'd call in C1, a realistic mode, good shooting mode, and then if it's all gone to pot and you just want to shoot as many frames as possible, then try your C2 out. Again, really nice to play around with. Right, I'm gonna press my function button here just to show you. Uh, so I've pressed my corner function button and this is where you can rotate through your options. And these are the couple of custom settings that I've just created. Brilliant. Okay, I'm just gonna switch back cameras and then we can go into a Q and A. So give me one moment. Great, so I'm back. Okay, so who has some questions for me? Oh, one second, I'm just gonna jump on the focus. There we 
Okay, lovely. Okay, yes, yeah, brilliant. I'm in focus now. That always helps. Okay, any questions? <laughs> wow, I did such a good job. No one's got any questions. Brilliant. Yes, I have one. Hello. What what power pack do you use for charging your uh, USB? That's a great question. Let me just grab it. Two secs. Uh, it is here somewhere. One moment. <laughs> Uh, give me one second and I will go find it. I'll be two seconds. Yeah, I just had it on charge actually. These things are fantastic. So I've got this little blue one here. And what is it called? It's called an Omars. And it is, what's the power rating on this one? It goes forever, to be honest with you. It takes forever to charge. So the capacity is 20,000 milliamps. So that's a fair whack. Um, I can charge, I've charged endless batteries off this. It's great. And it'll multi-charge as well. It's got a couple of different slots. So you can charge your phone and your camera at the same time. But yeah, these are, these are great. I think they're about 30 quid. 40 quid on Amazon. There's loads of them out there. And in the world that we live in nowadays, it's always good to have one in your bag for your phone and whatever else. Great. Anybody okay. else? Hey, Jens. Um, I have a question about ISO. Um, okay. So um, I've discovered that if I go with ISO 200, for example, I can, I can stretch it by at least three stops, I think in post. So when taking pictures, do you suggest we should lock the ISO or should we uh, keep it variable? That's a great question. That's a really good one. Yeah. Um, what really improved my photography for me was when I stopped using things like um, auto ISO, because I think with a bit of experience, uh, you know, like wildlife or whatever your niche is, you generally go, right, well, the shutter speed that really works is this. So for me as a street photographer, I want everything about 500th of a second. Generally, I want no, you know, no loose hands or bits where people turn and end up with a, you know, slightly softness here or there. And with wildlife, you have to up it even more. For me, it's always in a couple of thousandth of a second. Uh, so as you push that ISO up, obviously your dynamic range is increasing, but at the same time, you've got to get a sharp picture. So it's always going to be a bit of a balancing act between getting that right. So that's why I'll generally start at 800 ISO and I'll take a couple of pictures and go, well, there, you know, there, you know, everything's pretty sharp, the birds look okay. And then I'll start bringing down that ISO. And then you find that sweet spot between image quality, dynamic range, but it's sharp. Got it, thanks so much. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Unfortunately, it's just one of those trial and error jobs. But if you're shooting in RAW and you're using Lightroom or Capture One, I mean, Capture One's the one we really recommend. That's the one that all our ambassadors use. I know it's a bit clunky as software goes um, compared to other things that are a little bit slicker, but it is the best for noise reduction. And obviously when you're cropping in for birds and stuff like that, I think the golden rule is don't crop in more than a third, I find use the tele converters and then try not to crop at all is a, it's probably the best approach, but sadly the birds are never close enough, are they? Okay. Uh, any, any more questions, anybody? Yeah, if I can, please. Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, during the, you were discussing the, 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 the pro lenses and you mentioned, as I understand it, that you can do photo stacking with it. Mm. Uh, I'm confused about that because I thought photo stacking was, you know, controlled by the camera. So you don't need a special lens to do the photo stacking with, do you? No, 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 no. So what's really great about the software that's in the body of the EM5s, so the Mark 3s particularly, and your EM1s, Mark 1, Mark 2, Mark 3, and the X, is the ability to stack it in the camera. There's limited lenses. Golden rule is predominantly it's the pro lenses. So things like where it works really well is things like my lovely little 60 mil macro that's an incredible lens to do stacking with because it will just give you that extra depth that you need uh, but yeah all of these lenses work as really i shouldn't tell you that because you should buy macro lenses but if you've got one of these long lenses they are pretty good for a macro effect certainly and you know, you're a fair distance from your subject as well so kind of work really well no, I, I haven't got any pro lenses unfortunately i've got a 35 mil macro and i've got the 150 to 300 I find they're all very good, but I've never actually tried photo stacking. I've got the 
14, mm -hmm. 150 and whatever else, you know, but I've never tried. Could I still use that if I had the three, for example? Yeah. Uh, no, so the, it'd be your 30 mil will do stacking. It will, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So get on in there. And the 30 mil is nice to use for that because it's so easy. You just get in nice and close. And um, Yeah, it was brilliant then, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no. Have a go yourself. See okay. how you get on. But if, you, if you're having a trouble, just um, email me back after this and uh, I'll, I'll walk you through it. No problem, sir. Cheers, Jess. Thank you. No, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me back from this morning. Oh, that's no problem, sir. No problem. Anybody else? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's really appreciated. And obviously in this difficult uh, COVID-19 period, uh, sorry I couldn't see you in person. So hopefully next year we can do bird fair properly and I can be talking to you face to face, whether it's at bird fair, park cameras or, or your local London camera exchange. But stay safe everyone and enjoy your shooting. And I can't wait to see you all in person at some point in the near future. Stay safe everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Brilliant. Okay.